introduction. It is a huge pleasure to be here today, though I have to say it would be an even better pleasure if I were there today. Uh, I don't know what the weather's like in BC today, but uh, it is uh, most assuredly, at least in um, Vancouver, warmer than it is here in uh, Ann Arbor in Michigan. Uh, plus, that's one of my very favorite regions of the world to visit, uh, having been a, a longtime resident of Seattle and, and working at the University of Washington. Uh, I'll give a, a special call out to Hugh Davies, who's a, a former mentor and, and uh, ongoing mentor of mine, uh, and someone who I owe uh, actually a tremendous number of uh, pints to uh, for various uh, favors that he's given me over my career. So maybe it's just as well that I'm here and can't collect. Anyway, uh, again, great to see some familiar names and faces. And for those of you I don't know, I'm hoping that you'll enjoy this um, time that we have together this afternoon. I'm going to talk for 40 minutes or so. Very much looking forward to your questions. Uh, so before I dive into this talk about the Apple Hearing Study, that we have ongoing. I want to acknowledge that the, the work and the, the framing of the study that you see here is uh, not just mine. I have a team here, uh, Lauren Smith and Lin Wang uh, at the University of Michigan, and we are complemented by a team of very talented folks actually at Apple who are helping as well. So let's go ahead and dive into uh, the material here. Uh, and in fact, just to get you all thinking, uh, it's not quite maybe Friday afternoon there, but uh, it's fairly late on a Friday afternoon here on Eastern time. Just to get you thinking, let's do a quick uh, poll here. I've um, got a question. You can see the question on the slides. Hopefully the poll screen has just popped up for you in Zoom. Again, just trying to get a sense of uh, what people's understanding is as to what some of the health outcomes are that have been associated in the literature with noise exposure. Uh, so this polling technology is always marvelous when it works, but I will say it only works about 50% of the time for me. So fingers crossed that we make it all the way through here. Uh, so this is wonderful. Uh, you know, everybody seems to recognize that uh, hearing loss is a one possible sequel uh, from noise exposure, that's absolutely correct. And I see 100% recognize that hypertension is also uh, associated with um, noise. Sorry, I've got a twitchy mouse on this end. Uh, ischemic heart disease, the vast majority of you think that that is linked with noise, uh, as well as occupational injury. Uh, a smaller fraction of you think uh, cancer, and virtually 100% of you think sleep disturbance. I would say as a, a highly educated crowd of, of public health practitioners and researchers, you're right on here. I think the evidence is indisputable at this point as to the link between hearing loss and noise, as well as between hypertension and noise. Uh, there's quite strong though not perhaps as strong evidence of ischemic heart disease and noise. My own research here has documented in a number of different industries that there's a relationship between noise and injuries in the workplace. There are a few suggestive studies in the literature about cancer, but I would say that's uh, suggestive and no more. And then sleep disturbances, all of us who have lived in graduate student housing uh, will probably attest can definitely uh, be caused by noise among other factors. Great. So thank you for uh, all chiming in on the poll so rapidly and uh, kudos on getting the vast majority of those right. So let's talk for a minute about what we know here uh, in terms of noise. Some of you may be aware that the World Health Organization or WHO estimates that there are about 430 million people worldwide. So that's about a 16th of the world's population that have at least a moderate hearing loss. Uh, we know and have known for about a thousand years that chronic noise exposure in the workplace uh, can lead to noise induced hearing loss. And we think that something like uh, one out of five cases of hearing loss are actually directly attributable to workplace noise. There's also uh, some suggestion that maybe chronic noise outside of the workplace, environmental or community noise, might also be associated with noise-induced hearing loss. However, believe it or not, the data relating environmental noise to hearing loss are actually sparse and somewhat inconclusive. So we know what we know, and we know there are certain areas that where we have knowledge gaps still that need to be addressed. In particular, those knowledge gaps uh, related to our study here are that we need really more cumulative and long-term data on a couple of different things. The first is exposures. How much exposure do people have to environmental noise, as well as to music that people may pipe in through headphones or play on a stereo? Uh, we also need more uh, data on the impacts on hearing from environmental noise as well as from music. And then finally, we need more information about cardiovascular and stress impacts from environmental noise as well as from music. 
So in other words, the data say, basically we need more data. Uh, not shocking, I know, to hear from a researcher. Now, historically, all these kinds of data were very difficult to collect. Uh, some studies out there, including some done by your own faculty at the University of British Columbia, have had really very high quality assessments of exposure uh, and, and very often very high quality assessments of health outcomes, but relatively few studies have had very good evaluation of both those things. Most studies will have either really good exposure data or really good health data, but often not both of those things. Now, uh, another thing that we need to address is historically, at least from an occupational hygiene perspective, we have divided people's days into two segments and we've looked at them individually without considering both um, uh, in, a, in a synthesized manner. So typically we've looked at the work day, you know, a, a nominal eight hour, though the last time I worked eight hours was probably before I went to college. <laughs> uh, so an eight hour day where we can figure out here's a person's noise exposure for their eight hours at work. And then the other nominal 16 hours of the day, we we consider to be non-occupational and we can figure out what's a person's average exposure over that period too. Uh, relatively few studies have tried to combine those into a total noise exposure estimate. And one of the things that's really emerged in the last 30 years or so is people can have, of course, music exposure, particularly through headphones during both of those uh, silos of the day. And really, we need to overlay music on top of other exposures to determine what is a person's actual uh, comprehensive or, or total exposure to sound and noise over any 24 hour period. Now, just like any environmental hazard, when we think about exposure to sound or noise, we've really got three equally important components that we need to focus on. The first is intensity. So how much of the agent, in this case, noise is there? The second is frequency. So how often does the contact uh, between people and noise occur? And the third is duration. So when that contact occurs, how long does it last? Knowing something about any of these things is useful, but we can't truly understand exposure until we have uh, accurate information on all three of those uh, components of exposure. So I will often see in the, the lay literature, for instance, um, papers focusing or, or media reports focusing on, well, here's how loud an MP3 player can go, or here's the highest level at a rock concert. That's interesting information, but it's not particularly informative uh, without other information on, again, frequency and intensity and duration. So we've got a gap on the exposure side. Um, we have other gaps too, though. Uh, so the relationship between non-occupational noise and noise-induced hearing loss, as I said, is not nearly as clear as the one between workplace noise and hearing loss. There have been a number of short-term studies of uh, non-occupational noise and hearing loss. Those often have very good measures of hearing, maybe some personal noise measurements, but again, not so common to have both. And the generalizability of a short-term study to a, a lifelong exposure to non-occupational noise is unclear, I would say. There have, of course, also been longer term studies of non-occupational noise and hearing loss from noise. Those often have, again, very good measures of hearing and very poor measures of exposure, quite frankly. And those long term studies, as we all know, are relatively rare because they're really expensive and logistically challenging. Finally, any studies of music and noise-induced hearing loss are rare. Uh, those sorts of studies will often have good measures of exposure and maybe changes in hearing, but typically have very poor measures uh, of anything beyond a very short-term exposure on the order of, uh, for example, hours to a day. Whereas again, we are trying to extrapolate risk uh, over the course of a, an 80 plus year human lifetime. Uh, I also mentioned this knowledge gap of cardiovascular disease and stress. So there have been studies that have looked at noise in cardiovascular disease and stress, but many of those studies uh, have the same limitations uh, uh, induced by reality as the studies of noise-induced hearing loss. So they'll have good exposure measures or good health measures, but rarely both. And there have been almost no studies on the impact of uh, specifically music on our cardiovascular system and stress. So for example, how does music of a, a certain intensity compare to noise, uh, maybe broadband noise of the same intensity? Is it equally harmful to the cardiovascular system? Is music better because it's pleasurable? Is it worse for some reason? We just don't know. So this is another gap in our understanding. 
So basically what we need here are high resolution and long-term data on a couple of things. One, personal exposures to environmental noise, as well as to headphone sound, and then assessments of hearing impacts that could include hearing loss and tinnitus, again, specifically focused on non-occupational noise. So sound from the environment around us during our uh, non-work hours, as well as sound from our headphones. And so with this uh, kind of context of knowledge gaps, I'll start to introduce the Apple Hearing Study. So this was a study that we launched in November 2019, and it will run until 2024. If you'd like to learn some more details about the study, uh, we are registered on clinicaltrials.gov here in the U.S., and I've given you our, our study website as well if you'd like more information. So uh, we have a couple of overarching uh, goals. I'm so sorry about this mouse uh, uh, and objectives for the study here. So one of them is we want to understand what are typical sound exposures that people get from their headphones, something that previously has been virtually unmeasurable and the relationship of those exposures to the health uh, of the hearing of our participants. Also, for participants who have an Apple Watch, we want to understand from measurements made by the watch, what are environmental sound exposures that people have, and what's the relationship of those environmental exposures to hearing health and to stress. And as a, a, another aim, we basically want to understand how do participants interact with information about their exposures uh, that's given to them by these devices. So I'll give you here just a, a very high level conceptual map of how we think hearing loss uh, is associated with various things that we're measuring in our study. So hearing loss and, and tinnitus or tinnitus, both are correct, uh, are two of our primary uh, outcome measures that we're interested in. Now, as I've already said, we are um, uh, benefiting from you know, 100 plus years of research demonstrating that occupational noise causes noise induced hearing loss. So that's not a shocker to see that there. Uh, we are trying to get better data on environmental noise and its relation to hearing loss. And we know that both of those relationships to hearing loss are going to be uh, impacted in some way by people's use or failure to use uh, earplugs or earmuffs, hearing protection in other words. Um, we also suspect that people's location, and this is a U.S. study currently, so their location in the U.S. per uh, their self-reported zip code is probably going to be linked to their environmental and maybe their occupational noise levels and perhaps to their headphone audio listening levels as well. And then, of course, like all diseases, we know that there are other contributing factors here related to personal characteristics. So things like people's age, potentially their socioeconomic status, their gender, a family history of hearing loss, and any experience that they have with uh, getting a temporary change in hearing after noise, which might be indicative of folks who are especially vulnerable or susceptible to noise exposure. So let me give you a, a little bit of an overview of the study here. All of our participants uh, have to download a research app that was developed by Apple called Cleverly the Research App. And this is the uh, entirety of the participants interface with uh, the study team. So I will say, the uh, entirety of my research career prior to the study involved face-to-face -face data collection, primary data collection, where we meet the people. So this move to a, a completely digital data collection has been um, uh, difficult in some ways because we simply don't have the relationship with participants. They interact with the app, not with us, but it does allow for research at a much larger scale than we could do in person. Now, when people are enrolled into the study, which is uh, only done by, by volunteers, of course, we assign them randomly into one of two arms. So 40% uh, of our participants are randomly assigned to the basic arm. So they, like all Apple device users, can review their headphone and environmental exposures through the health app on their phones. And then the other 60% of participants go into our advanced group. And so these folks actually get notifications. They get prompted to go into the app and review their uh, exposure as well as some of their other uh, information. And this advanced group is also um, a group that receives, uh, as we say, triggered uh, events during the study. So if this 60% of participants has excessively high noise levels over uh, a 30 minute period or over an entire week, they are prompted to complete a short survey and also to take a hearing test, again, tied to those noise levels to see if they may be experiencing a temporary change in hearing compared to their baseline measure. 
So speaking of baseline, uh, like most epidemiological studies, when people enroll in the Apple Hearing Study, they complete a survey at baseline. And we survey them approximately quarterly after that. These surveys give us information about uh, key demographic factors, certain behaviors uh, and perceptions that people have of their environment, their exposures, uh, their hearing ability. Uh, also, we can learn about the occupation they have, um, uh, critical information like that. Uh, participants also take a hearing test, as I mentioned, at baseline, and then approximately quarterly after that. And we actually have two different hearing tests that we are delivering to people, again, via their app. Uh, on their iPhone. The first is uh, sort of standard pure tone audiometry at frequencies between 250 hertz and 8,000 hertz. Uh, and so that will tell us their hearing threshold level at each of those frequencies. We're also giving people a speech and noise test, again, delivered by their phone, to try to understand how well they can hear in the presence of background noise, which is a, a common complaint among folks with hearing loss, is background noise really interferes with their ability to, to clearly hear speech. Now, participants can share with us uh, their headphone audio exposures. These are shared continuously. So anytime a person is listening through headphones on their, uh, their iPhone, we get information not about what they're listening to in any way, but about the level at which they're listening. So we know how long they listened and at what level. That's, again, an unprecedented data type. Uh, historically, it simply wasn't available. And then for folks who have an Apple Watch, we can get environmental noise levels. We can also get heart rate and exercise information from the watch if the user, the participant chooses to share it. And that data again is shared continuously. So you can see we have a number of different streams of data here that we are uh, collecting, which is marvelous, but challenging. And so speaking of challenging, uh, as you may have already inferred, we've got multiple streams of data coming in. They're all time synced, which is fortunate, but they are occurring at different temp oral scales. So we've got survey data that are coming in monthly and in some cases annually. We have hearing tests, again, that are being uh, streamed to us roughly quarterly. But then at the minute level, or actually every 30 seconds, we're getting information on environmental sound from people's Apple Watches and uh, headphone audio from their listening devices as well. So you can start to see uh, trying to sync these things and understand and, and evaluate exposures over different time windows and different durations of time is, is a huge challenge. And of course, we also have to consider in all of our analyses, the potential latency or lag between when the exposure occurs and when we might see any changes in health. So uh, clearly, if you haven't gathered this already, we are very much doing crowdsourced or, or citizen science here in that we are not out making measurements on people. People are sharing measurements from their own device made in their own surroundings. And so I will just take a moment now and just mention that all types of crowdsourced data collection are only as valid as the methods and instruments that are being used. So you know, from a, a big data perspective, it's awesome to be able to enroll hundreds of thousands or millions of people in a study, but again, the data that come out of that study are, are only as good as the methods. So I'll, I'll take just a moment here. This is not going to be a, a comprehensive assessment of our methods, but uh, I'll mention that in terms of measuring headphone sound, this is something that's been sort of a holy grail for several decades now, trying to understand and measure long term what exposure are people getting through their uh, their over-the-ear uh, headphones that they listen to or through their earbuds. And it's only been recently, really in the last five years, that we have started to see the creation of standardized methods, um, primarily driven through efforts by the World Health Organization and the International Telecommunications Union. So what I'm showing you here are some grabs from documents uh, created by those organizations that have essentially established how do you do dosimetry for headphone audio exposures from phones and MP3 three players. And so the good news now is we have this standardized method that's been established. And so Apple and other manufacturers can uh, plug this standard into their devices and we can all start to collect across multiple platforms measures that are uh, similar and comparable. And so this has been a, a huge step forward again, having these standardized methods available to us.
Uh, now, I'll, I'll mention a moment here, something that isn't even quite hot off the presses. This is something we've um, submitted and are waiting for um, feedback on from our reviewers. Uh, we were able to do some laboratory experiments. Uh, this is a, a team of folks here at the University of Michigan at uh, Cardinal Chem Risk and also folks from NIOSH, uh, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. So we were able to test uh, eight Apple Watches, uh, Series 6, all running the latest watch operating system. System. And we measured using those watches in a controlled environment what noise levels uh, were being evaluated and, and reported by the watch's internal microphone. Now, we were able to do this research at the NIOSH Acoustic Testing Facility, excuse me, in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, so utilizing their reverberant chamber. And so basically what we did here was we exposed these watches to pink noise uh, in five decibel increments between 65 and 95 dBA. Uh, and then we also looked at uh, different octave bands. So how would the watch respond to uh, sound presented in the octave bands that you see here at intensities of 70 or 80 or 90 decibels. So we looked at what the watches were measuring in this chamber, and we had a gold standard measure as well. As you can see here, we had uh, uh, this Trident multi-channel acoustic analyzer software connected to a very high-end microphone, and we also had a, a type 1 sound level meter that we made independent measurements with. So we have kind of our gold standard measure here, and then we have what are the watches measuring. So again, as I've already alluded to, for us to have confidence in the results that we're getting here, we want to demonstrate or, or verify that the instrument, in this case, the Apple Watch, has um, uh, adequate performance here. And so I, I've posed a second poll question for you here. So sort of sitting back and thinking, uh, to be useful in research, uh, would a new crowdsourced data collection method, like the Apple Watch, for instance, would it need to have the same bias and precision and accuracy sort of uh, measures of measurement error as traditional or, or conventional exposure assessment methods? So I, I see about a third of you are saying it should. And uh, well, the numbers are jumping around a little bit here, but yeah, it looks like about a third of you are saying, yes, it should have uh, essentially equivalent bias, precision, and accuracy. Now, maybe now we've got a little bit of a shift here. Um, nevertheless, we've got more people saying this statement is false than uh, saying it's true. Now, for those of you saying false, I would absolutely agree. So um, from my perspective, uh, a type one sound level meter, something that's, uh, you know, has very tight performance specifications, is desirable for making measurements of sound, but is not very um, practical at scale. Uh, and so in this case, I would argue that, in fact, a device that doesn't have necessarily the same bias or precision and accuracy is still useful if we can quantify and understand in what ways does the watch differ, for example, from the tr uh, traditional or conventional measure. So thank you for completing that poll. So I'll share with you now some of our, uh, our results, again, that we've submitted for publication here. Uh, and I want to acknowledge especially Ben Roberts uh, and Chuck Cardus, two of my primary um, co-authors. So what we're looking at here are the eight different watches that we tested. And these are uh, essentially the mean levels that were or the, the difference between each watch and the uh, gold standard sound level meter that we were using. So one of the questions we had was, gosh, does it matter whether I'm taking a measurement with my Apple Watch or your Apple Watch? And in fact, as you can see here, the confidence intervals uh, essentially are all completely overlapping. So this is a bit of good news. We don't see significant differences by watch, uh, meaning that uh, one watch can be treated as interchangeable with the others. I will perhaps give credit here to Apple. I know they have sort of legendarily tight manufacturing standards, and I think that shows in that graph. Uh, now, here is uh, a comparison of the sound level meter and uh, the performance in aggregate across all eight watches at the five, at the, the five decibel step size uh, buckets that we looked at uh, for pink noise here. So this is across a total of more than 11,000 broadband measurements that we made. And so uh, the, the takeaway here is you can see the difference between the sound level meter and the watches, if there were no difference at all, all of these uh, um, uh, uh, clusters would be centered right around zero decibels. In fact, we have a little bit of bias here. And what we saw is uh, the sound level meter tended to read about 3.5 or 3.4 decibels uh, higher 
than the watches did. So this would suggest that the watches might be biased. Um, but again, we can deal with bias if we can understand how the watch is different, for instance, from the sound level meter. Uh, this is across those octave band measurements that you see uh, displayed across the x-axis here. So now we've got the octave bands um, at the lower x-axis label, and then we have the intensity level, 70, 80, or 90 decibels uh, as the, the secondary x-axis uh, label. And so once again, we can see these things are not identical. So an Apple Watch is not a type one sound level meter. That's probably not a shocking surprise to any of you. And we saw some, uh, some interesting associations. So the watches tend to read uh, actually lower than the reference microphone or our gold standard, uh, below 1,000 hertz, and then all the way up at 8,000 hertz. They're very similar to each other at 2,000 hertz. And then the watches actually read uh, a little bit higher at 4,000 hertz. So again, the watch is not a sound level meter, but we're trying to get as much useful information out of it as we can. So to sort of zoom out and, and quickly summarize those results, I would say, uh, in fact, compared to previous research that we and others have done, looking not at Apple Watches, but rather at apps uh, used to measure sound on smartphones, the watches are way more accurate than the majority of apps that have been tested. So if, if the difference becomes, uh, gosh, I'm gonna make a noise measurement with my phone versus I'm gonna make a noise measurement with the watch, the watch is gonna win because it, uh, it has more accurate measurements. Now the watches were outside uh, the two decibel tolerance that uh, the American National Standards Institute, uh, and I think the Canadian Standards Institute has the same. That's what they consider to be equivalent to a, a type two sound level meter. So plus or minus two decibels. So they're not quite meeting that, but they're pretty close in many cases cases. Uh, the watch measurements tended to show very good precision, so they were biased low compared to the sound level meter, but the measurements were, were quite tightly grouped. So this is all good news for us. It means that we can essentially adjust for uh, any bias in the watch and correct our measurements made uh, on our participants who are using Apple Watches. Now, I, I don't have time today, but I will mention we're um, in the process of uh, preparing and publishing other validation studies on things like our hearing measures. Again, no, no time to talk about those today, but um, rest assured that we are um, trying to get that out, uh, again, just to boost confidence in the results that we have from this crowdsourced uh, project. So let me shift gears now, and I'll, I'll give you some results from the, the larger study, the, the uh, validation study that you saw there was, um, it was done in a laboratory. These results that we're talking about now are from our participants. So at this point, uh, we've collected in aggregate about 300 million hours of uh, combined environmental noise and headphone audio. So this has sort of quickly become the largest data set on noise that I'm aware of in the world. Um, we've collected about 200,000 hearing tests to date and uh, well over 175,000 surveys. So, you know, this starts to feel like in combination uh, truly sort of a big data study. Um, one of the first things that we were able to do uh, was to try to map different noise levels uh, that we see on average by state here in the United States. And so the two figures you see on the right here, on the top, we're looking at environmental levels measured by the watch. And uh, on the bottom, we're looking at headphone audio levels, again, that people are getting through their listening device. And so the United States is a big and, and varied country, just like Canada. And so it's quite interesting that we can see across the different states, there are in fact uh, differences in average uh, environmental exposure, as well as an average headphone uh, level. So um, we've actually posted these maps and we'll continue to update them on our website as, as a way to sort of feed back to the public what we're finding. The other really cool, at least I think so, but I have a very low bar, I'll admit, uh, the really cool thing we can do is start to look at trends over time. So I'll just play this video for you here, uh, if we can get it to play, yeah. So every time you see the colors change on the figure here, we're jumping forward one week in time. This was starting at the beginning of 2020. Uh, so you can actually see here in the United States, um, 
levels kind of bottomed out in early 2020 as a result of the pandemic. And then as the year continued to go on, uh, so lighter colors here indicate lower sound levels, darker colors are higher exposures. So as the year rolled on, we started to see the country start to uh, creep back towards its um, pre-pandemic levels. So again, this is nothing that we set out to do. Of course, we just happened to be collecting data uh, as the pandemic hit, and we could start to ask interesting questions about changes uh, in noise exposure related to the pandemic. Similarly, uh, we can start to take a look at, well, gosh, what are the measurements of noise, not uh, by region, but rather by day of the week? And so these levels are presented start of 2020, just before the pandemic really hit the United States. You can see the weekend tended to be louder. Um, than the weekdays. And then you can start to see lockdowns went into effect. And every day, if you guys recall back to 2020, every day was the same as the next. Nobody's leaving home. There's no reason for one day to be louder than um, another. And then as we started to come out of the pandemic into the, well, as, uh, Restrictions were relaxed uh, regarding the pandemic in the summertime here in uh, 2020 in the US. We started to see this creep back up where again, um, overall uh, weekends tended to be louder than weekdays. All right, so uh, let me ask a, a third question here before I dive a little bit more into our noise exposures. So uh, which of the following limits do you think might be recommended by the World Health Organization? So, I'm uh, sorry, we've got, uh, <laughs> This mouth is, mouse is going to be the death of me, I swear. Uh, we have got uh, 70 decibels for 24 hours um, as an average for community noise and 80 decibels for a 40 hour average for music. Uh, well, I, I won't read through all the options here, but I'll, I'll sort of see what folks are, are thinking in terms of what the WHO recommends as safe exposure levels for the, the predominance of the public. And so I know this is a lot of uh, answers. Uh, perhaps I should have formatted this as a table. I apologize. But uh, it looks like the majority of you are saying 70 decibels is a 24 hour average for community noise and 80 decibels as a headphone average. And in fact, you are absolutely correct. So those are the two WHO recommendations that are relevant to the Apple hearing study here. So uh, what happens when we compare our results to those uh, recommendations from the WHO? Well, it turns out about a third of our participants have average environmental exposures that are over a 70 decibel 24 hour average. So that's concerning. I will say that community noise limit uh, or environmental noise limit, as well as the music uh, or headphone audio limit, both of those are specifically intended to prevent hearing loss. So this suggests there is a risk of hearing loss in at least a third of our participants. We also know that 44% of our participants either work now or have worked in a noisy workplace in the past, and that uh, almost two thirds of them report never wearing hearing protection during loud events. Only about 10% of our participants are over the weekly average for listening to music. So again, that's 80 decibels as a rolling 40 hour average. So it appears that people are uh, more at risk from the environmental sound than they are from uh, headphone exposures. Um, again, I mentioned that we had this uh, unexpected opportunity to look at changes due to the pandemic and the lockdowns that came. So this is just a screen capture from a, a paper we published late last year, or actually late 2020, looking at uh, noise exposures among our participants at baseline pre-pandemic, uh, this light gray section of each of the four um, uh, components of the graph here, which correspond to California, Florida, New York, and Texas, four of our uh, highest population states here in the US. That gray is uh, kind of a washout period. And then the, the hashed line basically indicates for each of these states when lockdown orders went into effect. And so again, didn't intend to, uh, to set out to make these measurements, but you can see in fact, we have a very strong demonstration here that when the government lockdowns went into effect, people's noise exposures dropped dramatically uh, across four states that took very different approaches. I, I don't know how harmonized the pandemic response has been in Canada, but in the US, it's, as you may be aware, uh, both a mess and all over the place. But despite the different approaches these states took, we see generally a, an almost identical inflection point here where the noise levels dropped significantly uh, somewhere between March 11th and March 17th, 2020. 
And this is just a graph, uh, again, extending those results out through the end of 2020, seeing that uh, for some states, uh, Florida is a great example, where essentially we got to pre-pandemic levels by uh, the end of November uh, and December 2020, whereas other states like California never really, at least at the end of 2020, had returned to their starting noise levels. So if you'd ask me prior to the pandemic, is there anything that could happen that could significantly reduce people's noise exposure over the course of uh, a week across an entire nation, I would have said, no, absolutely not. Are you kidding? But I have been proved wrong. The uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus did that and, and did it quite handily. So uh, some kind of high level uh, summary statistics here before we wind down and I take your questions. Um, we have 10% of our participants who have reported having a, a diagnosed hearing loss. When we look at the hearing tests that people are, are taking on the phone, we actually see hearing loss in about 22% of folks. That's compared to the World Health Organization's guidelines for uh, anything more than, uh, or anything worse than normal hearing, I should say. And about 7% of our participants have a hearing loss that's very consistent with a noise-induced hearing loss. In other words, they have uh, their worst hearing specifically at the 4,000 hertz frequency. 44% uh, of our participants haven't had their hearing test other than by the app in more than 10 years. Uh, so this is not um, uh, something that people are, are experiencing routinely. And about one in four of our participants are experiencing tinnitus a few times per week or greater. So that's a, a cause for concern. Now, long term, the goals for the study are, are multiple. We want to characterize, as I said, environmental noise as well as headphone audio. And one of the things that we're uh, starting to employ machine learning uh, approaches for is to identify, well, what are some sort of common exposure patterns? Can we identify profiles of different participants that allow us to kind of bin them into different risk groups based on the, the temporal pattern of their exposure or maybe the intensity pattern? Uh, as I said, we absolutely want to evaluate the association between hearing loss uh, and sound exposure. Uh, and again, we have audiometric results. We have um, self-reported tinnitus. We also have a speech and noise test, as I mentioned. And we want to do all of these analyses controlling for other uh, personal and, and demographic and other risk factors. We also have an opportunity here to evaluate measures of objective hearing loss, like from our app, as well as from subjective or perceived measures. We can do that for hearing loss. We can also do it from noise exposure. People are telling us what they think we're exposed to, and we're also measuring those exposures. We can see how well those self-reports uh, actually stack up against an objective measure. And then finally, we will be evaluating the impacts of this informational inter intervention. So basically, do people whose phone is prompting them to go and take a look at their exposures, do they maybe change those exposures over time uh, as a result of that uh, uh, fairly mild intervention? So some examples of things we're going to be able to do from this study, again, we'll have uh, a tremendously large data set of personal or individual level environmental noise as well as music exposures. We can start to think about what are people's exposures to music at multiple time scales. Uh, also, what are their exposures to environmental noise at multiple time scales? Um, I'm, I'm very excited about employing maps to convey a lot of this information. So what sort of national or, or regional or state level trends do we see in hearing ability and noise exposures, et cetera? You know, the United States recently has, uh, just in the past five years, created this national transportation noise map. So this is our best guess at what Americans are exposed to uh, across the United States. This is really the only national level noise map that we have. Uh, we can now augment this with our, um, you know, person specific longitudinal data to see basically how well does this map correspond to actual measures made on, on real people. And then, you know, from an occupational hygiene perspective, which is my training, we'll have an opportunity to see how much is noise exposure in the workplace contributing to people's total exposure compared to their non-occupational noise. So I'm, I'm really excited that we will finally be able to start filling this void uh, to connect the dots between environmental noise and music and people's hearing at baseline and any changes they experience in hearing loss or in tinnitus over the course of the study. And also to look at heart rate variability, uh, perceived stress, and, uh, and heart rate as measures, again, of 
cardiovascular impacts of noise. And once again, uh, just trying to tease out, well, what is the impact, if any, of people getting prompted by their phone to uh, either review their uh, noise exposures or uh, getting messages that, hey, your exposure was actually over what the WHO recommends for uh, a person to receive in a week. Does that actually change people's behavior or not? And I will say I was uh, so pleased to find this, uh, this um, graphic here, uh, text alert, text contains 26 typos, the implication being here, you've typed it when you're drunk. Uh, the technology in phone these days is, is quite remarkable. I think we can all agree. So like any study, we've got limitations, you know, our exposures and outcomes that we observe may not be representative. This is a voluntary study uh, only among people who have access to Apple products. But I will say, even if the sample is non-representative, it still is going to give us better data than we have right now on, on population level exposures and outcomes, particularly when we do statistical adjustment to account for the, uh, the measurement error inherent in any device. Uh, we are also letting people use non Apple headphones to share their headphone uh, audio exposures, that expands the number of people who can participate, but it also introduces some um, inaccuracies in the data. We're going to do sensitivity analyses restricted only to our Apple uh, listening device users to see what the influence might be of that. I'll also mention um, we are very privacy centric in this study. Uh, participants can turn off the notifications from the research app and we will never know that. So that complicates our uh, assessment of our intervention. Uh, also, hearing protection. We don't have super detailed information on when and where people use hearing protection, and we have no information on their attenuation. So instead, we're going to be controlling basically for their self-reported uh, usage frequency. And then finally, I'll, I'll just mention participant engagement. So again, this is my first completely digital study. We don't have personal interface uh, or interaction with our participants. They're not compensated in any way. And uh, due to the, the sort of innovative and novel nature of our hearing tests, we have not yet been able to share people's individual results from their hearing tests on their phone with them. Uh, but we are providing regular updates at a study level uh, to our participants. Um, and I will note that uh, like any large study, we have attrition in our participants and we'll be using statistical modeling to, uh, to minimize the impacts of attrition. So in conclusion, uh, this study has been set up to address the three knowledge gaps that I talked about earlier. I'm also excited not um, only about the, the study and the data we're collecting, but I think this study can provide a great template for future assessments of different kinds of exposures and health outcomes, again, at very large scales. And I, I will say I, I've been quite pleased at, at sort of how we've been able to demonstrate the, the power of academic and industry partnerships. So with that, I will thank you all. Again, I'll acknowledge that the study is funded by a, a grant from Apple to the University of Michigan. I'll, I'll thank my colleagues, uh, Lauren Smith and Lin Yan Wang again, uh, and encourage any of you interested to visit our, our study website. We are per, uh, recruiting participants still. And so if you're curious to learn more, uh, you can download the research app at the link you've got there. So again, thank you so much for your time. And I, I look forward to your questions.